Today on the Marketplace of Ideas, a conversation about the craft of freeform radio with Ken Friedman, general manager of WFMU, the longest running freeform station in the United States. It's the Marketplace of Ideas. I'm Colin Marshall. Ken Friedman has, since 1985, been the general manager of WFMU, the world-renowned freeform radio station that's been broadcasting longer than any other in the U.S. He also hosts a morning show there, and alongside Andy Breckman, co-hosts my personal favorite FMU program, Seven Second Delay. Ken, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. It is kind of funny that I'm here in the KCSB studio in Southern California. You're over on the other side of the country, almost as far as you can get in the U.S., you're in Jersey. And you wonder why would a Southern California radio station want to broadcast about an East Coast, a New Jersey radio station, but in in a way it doesn't matter at all because this show podcasts and gets most of its listeners that way. And FMU is, is online, it streams, it podcasts. It was the first to all of that stuff. How do you envision... FMU's audience. I mean, there must be some kind of cognitive dissonance based on the fact that you run what is ostensibly a radio station, but is in reality just a a, a cultural entity that extends anywhere. Yeah, I don't think of us as a radio station, strictly speaking, anymore. We've definitely um, metamorphosed into some kind of hybrid radio online entity. (laughs) When did that shift in your thinking change? Was it exactly when you guys went online in 97? Or, I mean, that was streaming. You were online earlier with a website. But when did this, how long a process has this been in your mind? Um, It's been happening steadily since we first launched our website back in 1993. And then we started streaming in 97. And uh, when we started streaming, a lot of people told me uh, there were a lot of skeptics among our listeners and our staff members who felt that um, radio streaming was going to be, be something more akin to CB radio um, <laughs> as opposed to a new form of media. And uh, a lot of people said, it's not even radio when we started streaming. But it was pretty clear when we started streaming full time that, uh, in fact, it was radio, that we were picking up the same types of listeners um, as we got over the FM band. But it really wasn't until... Um, much later, I think in 2000 to 2003, when we started just expanding um, the offerings that we had online um, to on-demand programming and podcasting, as well as the, the blog and forums and message boards and and then Facebook and Twitter, uh, that we started realizing that it's really becoming something different. Um, it's not, strictly speaking, radio anymore. And And one example I can give you is on my own Wednesday morning radio show, uh, besides doing a live radio show, I'm also posting pictures along with every every uh, song that I'm playing. And listeners can also comment um, with, with me and with each other um, on the playlist page of the program. And what I started realizing a few months ago is that there were a, fair, a fairly good number of people who were logging on to that playlist page for my show every week, and they weren't even listening. <laughs> they, they were there to see the pictures unfold, to see, the, to see what music I was playing. Uh, the reason why they weren't listening is because they were listening at work and their their employer had had blocked uh, streaming audio through the company firewall. So they were doing the next best thing, which was simply logging onto the page so that they could see what songs were playing, look at the pictures as they unfolded and interact with other listeners. And when when I realized that I have these people logging onto this ostensibly a, a radio show page every week, but they're not listening, I, I, that kind of hit me over the head like this really has become something different. I have seen that go on with your own show and, and with others as well, with what DJs do with the online components of theirs. But I have to wonder, since I, I have some idea of what freeform DJs are like, this is a freeform station I'm at after all, this kind of thing must weird a few of them out, correct? Oh, yeah, definitely. You mean, <laughs> you mean our DJs? Yes. Oh, absolutely. What are the re- What's the range of responses to this? I mean, are they just all over the place? Or is there generally people are down for anything that gets their show listened to or or what? No, we we have we run the whole gamut of responses. There's there's people who are right there, can't wait to embrace any kind of technical innovation that we unveil or that we make available to people. There's people who are racing ahead of the station, 
um, in terms of what we make available to them. And there, you know, there's people who, there, some of our DJs, I can barely keep up with uh, their technical innovations. Um, and then the other range are people who feel like this is not radio. Um, I don't want to post the name of the song that I'm playing. Listeners should be surprised by the segue. You know, radio is about the segue. They don't they don't want to post the name of the pic, the, the name of the song um, <laughs> either live or even after the fact. Uh, there were when we started there. There are still some people who are uncomfortable with the idea of programs being available after the show is over on demand. So it really runs. It runs the whole gamut. But I think the difference between FMU and a lot of other radio stations is that um, at least at WFMU, the management is uh, in favor of technical innovation and in favor of embracing these new forms of media. It sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong in this assumption, but that every individual there at FMU, at least the ones on the air, they, they all have their ideas about what radio should be and some of them that 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 is the idea of a previous generation or previous generations yeah that's true and i think that that's one of the great things about wfmu is that it's it's more than a radio station about music there really is an appreciation um and an awareness of the history of radio and the art of radio so it's something that people take very very seriously is, is what we're is what we're doing as radio as opposed to just coming on and, and spinning tunes this idea you mentioned earlier how some some djs would take exception to some sort of technological step forward fmu was making with the with the complaint that that isn't radio now i i, I realize i'll i'll hear that myself and think what you know what do you what do you mean not radio but then now i'm thinking has there ever been a point when some sort of transformation or some sort of technical innovation for FMU made you wonder, is this really, is this really radio? Although I suppose you don't care now because, you've, as you've said, it's more than a radio station to you. Yeah, I really don't care whether it is radio or not anymore. And, and in fact, um, part of what we do is clearly not radio. But I, I, think that, I think that radio programmers have to define themselves far more widely than what they've done in the past in the same way that horse and buggy manufacturers shot themselves in the foot by not redefining themselves as vehicle manufacturers, <laughs> uh, radio programmers and television programmers and journalists for that matter have to define themselves far more widely and they should be defining themselves as streaming providers, I think. And a radio stream or a music stream or a news audio stream, that's just one of the many types of streams uh, that radio people should be engaging in. Uh, there's all sorts of different streams that they can put out. A blog is pretty much a stream. It's a stream of images, of writing, of movies. Um, and the, the similarity to radio comes in in that it's, it's a stream. It, it's an unfolding daily or perhaps even hourly uh, channel of content. And radio programmers have to think of themselves more as content providers and stream providers as opposed to simply audio stream providers. I talk to a lot of community and free form and college radio people, and they'll often bring up FMU as, oh, if only we could do what FMU does. Oh, they've, they've, they've got so much going on. If, you know, if, if we could just get the, the, the scope that FMU has, the technological advances they have, the, the distribution methods they have. And what it makes me wonder is, since FMU was held up as sort of the early adopter of so many so many innovations that have become what what programmers and directors at freeform stations want. I have to ask how how did FMU know to do all this stuff from getting on the web in ninety three to streaming in ninety seven to show archiving, which most freeform stations can't even get on to this day. How did they get this information? How did you get it? Um, I guess it was sort of a matter of survival. Um, we we started very early on, and um, I've always kind of thought that FMU's core audience, our core demographic, if you will, are artists and weirdos. So so <laughs> going back to the 70s and 80s and 90s, we had all these artists and weirdos in the New Jersey, New York metropolitan area listening to us. And uh, one of them was very active on what was called the ARPANET at that time, the predecessor to the Internet. And before the World Wide Web, uh, this one listener, Henry Lowengard, had actually put together about 15 or 20 pages up on what was called gopher space, which was the predecessor to the World Wide Web. I was always very unhappy 
with the limitations of our FCC license, the fact that we were licensed to cover New York City, but in reality, we could barely cover New York City just because of the uh, geography and the buildings. Uh, and there really wasn't anything we could do about it. So I, so when I read in the early 90s, I think in Wired Magazine, that it was going to be possible to transmit radio over the ARPANET, um, I decided I'm there. We're, <laughs> we're doing that as soon as humanly possible. Um, so when it started becoming humanly possible, we transferred these gopher pages into uh, web pages, and we were off and running. And, uh, and then we just kind of waited a couple of years to see how streaming played out. And we didn't start... We didn't start streaming right away because we wanted to see which format would be adopted as the uh, as the dominant format. And uh, by 1997, though, we did start streaming full time. But even before that, we were getting uh, licenses from artists and, and bands and putting up song files uh, long before the MP3 download revolution started. Uh, but all this was really kind of a, a matter of survival for us because we were owned by a college, Uppsala College, that was having severe financial problems. And uh, it was clear that they were going bankrupt and we wanted to survive the bankruptcy. And we looked to the Internet as a way of uh, getting our signal out there and getting more listeners without having to compromise our programming philosophy. And, and that's pretty much what happened. That's how we looked at it. And that is how it played out. And the college did go bankrupt. And WFMU was the only part of the college to survive. So we had this utopian idea. <laughs> and <laughs> amazingly enough, it did kind of come to pass. But we're still struggling with it because broadcasting on the Internet is so much more expensive than FM broadcasting. Um, and, uh, and we're still actually a pretty small station. So we, we really do struggle with the expense and the complexity of it all. As far as you know, what is the composition of the FMU audience then? How much is, is New Jersey and the side of New York? Or I know you have a booster going in deeper into New York. And, um, and how much is the world at large? Well, even though we have a fairly uh, substantial Internet audience, uh, most of it is contained within our broadcast area. Um, I think there's this this myth or this idea that, a, that an online station or a station that's very active online has most of its listeners all over the country, all over the world. That's really not the case. The, the overwhelming majority of our listeners do live and work inside of our broadcast area, uh, and they listen on the Internet perhaps at work, and then perhaps when they go home, they listen on the radio if they can get it on the radio or on the Internet if they can't. Uh, and if they're in New Jersey and they have a car, uh, they might listen to it in the car on the way to work. And then they get to work and they turn it on on the computer. So the most common kind of listener we have these days is a hybrid listener, somebody who listens sometimes to the FM signal and sometimes to the online signal. Uh, only about a quarter of our listeners are people who listen exclusively to the online signal um, and another quarter are people who listen exclusively to the FM signal. And the other half are more or less hybrid, hybrid listeners. It makes me sound like the uh, evil Dr. Moreau <laughs> um, <laughs> talking about hybrid listeners. Your vast army of hybrid listeners doing your bidding, yes. <laughs> now, I want to get an idea of, I suppose, I, I, this is not an, an issue of prognostication that I, that I want to get into, but it's what people tend to say that, well, you know, once, once cars ship with internet capabilities and once everybody is carrying around a device that can stream anything at any time, do you, do you see, do you see FMU becoming more, more of a worldwide entity or is there still a local, a localness you want to retain as long as is absolutely possible? Uh, there's definitely a localness that I want to retain. I, I think that if you, if you if you set your sights too wide and you decide that you're going to really become a national station or an international station, I, I think I think we really would lose a lot of our personality. We're proud of the fact that we're from New Jersey. We're proud of the fact that New Jersey is the laughing stock of the nation. <laughs> um, I was deeply heartened by the recent political scandals. Um, that happened in Jersey City um, because, again, it established New Jersey uh, in that great historic um, underdog way. Um, so we're very proud of the fact that we're from New Jersey and we're very, very much, um, very, very much steeped in that in that tradition. And we don't want to lose that. So even though we we have more listeners all over the country and all over the world all the time, uh, I definitely want to retain the local character and the focus on the local 
on the local scene that we have here. Because as I said before, despite the fact that we do have listeners all over the country and all over the world, the overwhelming majority, we're talking 80, 90 percent um, of our online listeners are still in the New Jersey, New York area. There is the Jersey sensibility, but there's also the specific FMU sensibility. I think any listener would would say or they would agree that when they tune into FMU, they're getting they're getting a certain, despite the variety, despite the fact that the DJs can do essentially whatever they want, they're getting a certain aesthetic, a certain a certain feel, a certain uh, not not mood so much. But I'm sure you know what I'm talking about in the sense that has this has this FMU sensibility been in any in any way deliberately crafted or is there is it something that simply emerges from the type of people that gravitate toward the station and are willing to put in the time and the effort and the work to compose what it what it broadcasts it definitely has not been intentionally crafted and i think that's the great thing about radio and uh, one of the thing one of the things that i'm most proud of about wfmu is that it has an organic personality um and i think that's the strength of radio and i think that's what radio has unfortunately lost um, historically, uh, if you go back to the to the heyday of radio in the fifties, sixties, and seventies, and so many radio stations had their own local organic personality, and you can't create that. You can't create that out of focus groups. You can't create it out of market research, and unfortunately, that's what radio lost um, as it was corporatized and and as voice tracking took over and formats like Jack FM uh, took over the landscape. It lost that, and it's really unfortunate because that's what you need. You need that local, distinct, niche personality to thrive on the Internet. And uh, that's what WFMU developed over the years, and that's what we retained, and I think that is partly why we have been successful on the Internet, whereas many other radio stations have not. Now, I once worked in commercial radio, and that industry sucks. I don't want to go there again. And I do listen to a lot of what's called what people tend to call mainstream public radio shows that have national distribution on some public radio network and both of them it it seems have it seems they could stand to learn something from freeform radio but do, do you think there are any specific lessons that either of those either of those sides could draw from the freeform world and what freeform does right i'm not sure the the term freeform actually um is somewhat problematic to me as well, even though it's even though it's what I've spent almost my entire adult life working in in freeform radio. But one freeform radio station can be completely different, even polar opposite from another freeform station. Uh, WFMU's brand of freeform is just one particular brand. We definitely have areas that we focus on and other areas that we're ignorant of. We, we don't we don't even attempt to touch every genre. Um, or touch everything across the board. So I, so I think it is important um, to not go for diversity and uh, juxtaposition and as many genres as you can just for the sake of itself. It is important to have some kind of focus, but it's also really, really important um, to let programmers um, act as curators and to let radio stations act as curators um, because I think that's what a lot of listeners will be attracted to, just in in the same way that in the heyday of the independent record store. Um, I remember going into independent record stores when I was in college and I would go into a store um, and I would just buy, I would buy a hundred dollars worth of records uh, and I wasn't familiar with any of them. And the only reason why I bought them was because I trusted the taste of the people who were stocking the record store. And that was how I discovered a lot of music. And I think that radio stations have to play the same role. Uh, and they used to play the same role. And if there is one lesson that mainstream public radio and commercial radio and community radio uh, can take from from whatever we've done. It's that radio stations should be acting as curators. Listeners should be looking at those radio stations for their taste and their knowledge um, and to, to be exposed to new things that they don't necessarily know. And that act of intelligent curation is so much more powerful than the automated curation that we're seeing in such online entities as Last FM and Pandora. Those are interesting. Those recommendation engines are interesting, but I don't think anything can replace uh, an intelligent human curator. The notion of a radio station as a curator or as a filter is fascinating to me because 
any of us can see who spend any time online or in media that this is the time that now more than ever people need filters people need curators to help them navigate and they can choose their curators and filters freely but they they will need them if they're if they're to find something they will want at some point but i suppose what what i want to get at at the core of this is 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 it an issue of of a of a core personality for WFMU to have, or or a core set of personalities to to develop and and make make in a sense reliable for listeners. Is that the, the essence of of good curation? Well, I'm I, I'm not sure because I don't think WFMU is reliable. Um, <laughs> we're actually very very unreliable, and I'm not sure if that's a strength or a weakness or or sometimes both. Um, I myself turn my own radio station off six or seven times a day. Um, sometimes screaming as I turn it off. <laughs> uh, and then I turn it on again ten minutes later, uh, and we're not we're not afraid to do that. Um, so I, I, if what you're getting at is how do you recreate something like this, I have no idea. <laughs> I, I don't think that anything, nothing could possibly um, create an entity like WFMU out of scratch. We've been on the air for 51 years, and uh, it's a true community radio station. Insofar as everybody on the air came from the community of listeners. So we've put out certain types of programming. There's been a certain musical, uh, philosophical, um, even comedic aesthetic that's been put out, and that's attracted more people back in um, who got it, who understood it, and were able to add to it. And then on a managerial level, I'm always interested in bringing people in who get it but are going to take it in a new direction. I don't want people who are just going to push back the exact same thing we've been putting out. So on one hand, I want people to get it. I want our new programmers uh, to clearly understand what WFMU is and and where it's coming from, but I want them to take it to new places also. You've hit on something that I find just hugely important here, which is that when I hear stations talk about how do we become more like FMU, how do we be how do we be our own FMU? Well, it seems that that's by its very nature an impossible task because that would be in it, that would be replicating the unreplicatable that that if anything is fmu's strength that nobody is going to uh, is going to duplicate it correct yeah i think so uh i, I it would be very very hard to duplicate this and or and it would be it would be very hard to try to build a brand new radio station from the ground up uh with a distinct personality right off the bat radio is a very very long-term form it takes years and years for a radio program to develop an audience. I think it takes years and years for a radio host to really get into his or her own groove. And it takes years, if not decades, for a radio station to develop a really strong sense of self and a strong listening community. So it's not something that I don't think it is something that can be developed overnight. And since you've been at FMU for the length of time you have, how much how much of a degree of change have you seen in the personality of the station? I mean, of course, we've talked about the technology, but in in the, I don't know if aesthetic is necessarily the word, but in, in, in what FMU is, regardless of how you're listening to it, how much has that changed since you've been there? Well, it's changed quite a bit. Um, it's, it's hard for me to to comment on that because I'm too much on the inside of it, but but it has really, it has changed quite a bit. I mean, one one big change is that when I joined the station um, in the mid-1980s. Uh, a lot of people were doing two or three or four shows a week. Uh, so we had a much smaller air staff, and now now everybody does just one show a week. So that's that's been a big change. Musically, it's much more diverse now. The music industry and the whole music scene has changed so much um, during this time also. It, it's, it's become so utterly factionalized and, and genres that never existed before have emerged um, and subgenres and sub subgenres. So it, it it has changed quite a bit. And yet certain things have remained consistent during that time also, which I think is um, WFMU's strong musicological sense. There's a, a really strong sense of musical history. There's an interest in the past as well as a, a real interest in, in the future and listening to forward looking music and, and trying to merge the two. I think there's a, a humor, there's a certain self-deprecating humor that has consistently run through a lot of the programming um, and a lot of the hosts as well. So on one hand, um, tons of things have changed, 
uh, at WFMU, and tons of things have changed in the entire music and radio landscape in general. But there have been a couple of threads which have cons- which have been consistent running through our history. This uh, this 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 idea of genres. Now, I remember reading an interview with you. Uh, it was it was from quite a while ago. It was from the mid '90s, probably the later '90s, where you. We're talking about freeform radio's task as as a destroyer of musical biases, and this kind of links in my head with this idea of of it seems to me FMU has an interest in breaking down genre walls when possible, or at least pulling stuff out of out of its genre cloisters. Do you still do you still conceive of the the, the destruction of musical biases as a as, as high on the priority list for FMU? Yeah, I think it's one of the more noble things that we can aspire to achieving. Um, it, it's it's very it's very hard to do, um, but I think that a really excellent freeform programmer is able to do that. Um, but but that that gets into the art of the segue and the art of set construction, um, musical set construction, and and uh, finding finding DJs who are able to mix in. Um, all sorts of disparate musical and sonic elements um, and make it make sense. Um, you can play Bach next to the Beatles, but there's a right way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it. There's a way that makes sense and makes uh, a light bulb go off in people's heads. Uh, and there's a and there's a way that doesn't do that. So it's a, it's a question of it, it's it, it's it's really a craft and uh, it is very, very hard to achieve. But it's, it definitely is something we aspire to. Um, but but it's very, very hard even at WFMU, finding people who are able to do that. The DJ selection process, this is something that completely fascinates me because first and foremost, let's get this clear, there's got to be just enormous competition to get on that schedule. There is, yeah. How many people get turned down per per round, would you think? Probably about 40. And that's compared to, I, I can't think of the exact number, how many are currently on the schedule? About sixty. Okay, so yeah, you, we can get an idea of the uh, of the comparative numbers right there. And when there is a a space open, and you need a DJ, and you're looking at this pool, I guess I should ask how many people decide on this. And when you are personally involved, what are you listening for? Well, one person decides, and that's the program director, ah. um, which currently is me again. Um, <laughs> I'm now. <laughs> I'm now in my third stint as program director after taking about 11 years off. Um, I just became program director again last year. So the program director decides alone, although we do have a, an advisory committee made up of other DJs, you know, that, that gives feedback and might make suggestions and so on and so forth. But they really don't, they're not involved in the, uh, in the creation of the monopoly board, so to speak, who actually, who actually gets on the weekly schedule. And in terms of, what I'm looking for as program director, um, I'm looking for a lot of different things. I'm looking for a lot of different things. I'm, I'm looking at um, basically the strength of their radio program, um, defined as defined, you know, and 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 I try to define the strength of their radio program on what kind of program they're doing. So one person might be trying to do a comedy show, another person might be trying to do a very serious music show. Uh, somebody might be trying to do a uh, a very experimental sound collage show. So these programs have to kind of be judged in different ways, and I try to try to judge them on their own merits. Um, but I'm also trying to look at the schedule as a whole, and I'm trying to make sure that we're not leaning too heavily in one direction. Uh, if there's an area that we've been weak on, I might go out of my way to try to strengthen us in an area where an area of musical weakness. Um, I'm also definitely interested in people who... Uh, who I think know how to use the internet and know how to use social media and uh, are showing themselves as being adept at, um, at merging radio and uh, the online world. And I'm also looking at people who are able to fit in uh, to our collective because WFMU is, as a community radio station, it is something of a collective. So I'm, I'm, it's very important for me to, to find people who fit in socially, who contribute to the organization outside of their program, as well as doing a very strong program. So there's a lot of different things that go into it. Uh, fortunately, one of the things that's been made possible through the Internet is that we're no longer limited to the 168 hours of the week schedule. So it's it, that's been great because now it's possible to include people 
uh, in our weekly programming offerings, even if I can't fit them on the schedule. So if somebody is if somebody's not able to get onto the schedule, they, we still make it available, make it possible for them to perhaps do a podcast. This makes me envision a paradoxical scenario where somebody submits a demo of a program and it's listened to, and this program, this is a program, let's say that sounds it sounds like nothing WFMU has ever put on, and that also means in a way that maybe it's something that, that FMU should put on. Do you understand what I mean? Like something will sound completely different and maybe initially out of FMU's sensibility, but maybe in a way because of what FMU's sensibility is like, that means it should be there? I, am I getting this across at all? Yeah, you are, and I can give you an example. You mentioned at the beginning of the show that one of your favorite programs was Seven Second Delay, which is a comedy show that I do with a, a comedian friend of mine, Andy Breckman. And when, when Andy was trying to get on the air, we actually had a committee that, that actually made programming decisions. And it was that experience that made me realize that uh, making artistic decisions by committee is not a good idea. <laughs> because Andy's, Andy's sense of humor was very, very different from uh, the, <laughs> the prevalent sense of humor at the station. It was very unhip. It was kind of borscht belt, um, <laughs> Hollywood, corny. But he was very, very funny. But he was just coming from a completely different place. And uh, the five or so people on the committee just couldn't wrap their heads around it. It was too different. It was too uncool, too unhip. Um, and he really had a very hard time getting on the air. Fortunately, he did get on the air. And now it's one of our very most popular programs. But I think that's, that, that gets to one of the problems is that if you have decisions, if you have programming decisions made by committee, and I think this kind of gets to design decisions as well and artistic decisions in general, I don't think that those types of decisions are best made by committee uh, for kind of the reasons that you're getting at. I think that it's a lot easier for an individual uh, to, to make a decision that this is completely, that something's completely new and different from anything that we've done, but it does have a place here and it's worth a shot. It's worth a try. For those just tuning in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas. I'm Colin Marshall. You can find our complete interview archive, listen to this program again, or any other, at colinmarshallradio.com. My guest is Ken Friedman, General Manager of WFMU, the longest-running free-form radio station in the United States. This brings up something so important, which is that you mentioned that FMU is, is a bit of a collective, and in some ways very much of one, and... It's also, of course, a media organization, and I think of other media organizations whose whose output I have heard or watched. I, I won't name any names, but this happens a lot in national media, where it's founded with good intentions of variety and and a wide range of experiences for the end user, but it ends up just by the nature of organizations and the way they the way they continue to exist, they become self perpetuating bureaucracies, essentially with a house with a house ideology that just gets stronger and stronger with each passing year because the, the same people selecting are the ones that conform most to it. What precautions do you and others in the management take to keep FMU? Because obviously it hasn't become that. How have you kept it from going in that direction where it just becomes more and more of a certain, a certain way of thinking and just gets narrower and narrower into that? I think what you're, what you're getting at is the fact that a lot of public radio stations and community and college radio stations um, have suffered from uh, identity politics, oh, yes. which, has, which has been the downfall of many, many left-leaning organizations. And that's something that I, fortunately, I was aware of that really early on uh, when I first became general manager and program director. And I was aware of the pitfalls of programming by ideology, um, meaning giving uh, a block to the folk contingent and a, and a block to the rock and roll contingent uh, and a block to every different political ideology that you could come up with and giving each little musical and political ideology um, their own turf. And it, it's not a good way to build a radio station. In fact, it's a really good way to destroy a radio station. And I saw that happen to a lot of stations and it still happens to a lot of stations. And instead, WFMU has kind of tried to come up with a coherent overall philosophy of free form and trying to break down genres and trying to dedicate ourselves to the craft of radio that cuts across all that. Um, and at the same time, um, there are certain pitfalls that I've tried to steer away from, such as um, alternating programming. Um, I, I don't, I, I hate it when programs are alternating 
um, week to week, um, the ever shortening time slot, <laughs> uh, which is another another death blow for a lot of radio stations where the, the, the slots go from four hours to three hours to two hours to one hour. I've tried to get away from that so that most of our programs are still three hours. Um, and also uh, one of the most difficult things has been to try to keep people from uh, getting a death grip on a certain time slot. Uh, which is a really big problem with a lot of radio stations and why a lot of radio stations, uh, I think, get caught in ruts is because uh, time slots do tend to become little fiefdoms and uh, it's very, very hard uh, to give new people a shot when, when, when the entire program schedule is, is uh, nailed down and programs develop an audience and, and oftentimes a very rabid, loyal audience. It's very, very hard then to give new programmers the same chance that the old programmers were given when they joined the station. Uh, and we do have a somewhat painful way of dealing with that, but at least we have a way of dealing with it, uh, which, which most community college public radio stations don't. Uh, we call it the enforced sabbatical. Uh -huh. uh, but we try to, we, we try, I, I do try to balance it because as I said, radio is a very long-term form. So you want to be able to give programmers uh, a chance to be in a slot long enough that they can really connect with an audience and get in a groove uh, and, and get something going with, in, in terms of uh, affecting people and, and, and communicating with an audience. But at the same time, you don't want to let them sit there for 20, 30 years and thereby uh, eliminate any possibility that new programmers are going to get the same chance that they had. The breaking into warring fiefdoms is a phenomenon that I've witnessed at a few stations. It seems to be, to my mind, the most common problem at a free-form college community, whatever you want to call it, type of station. Now, to your mind, what else, what else are the pitfalls specifically of these types of stations that, that, are, that are in the forefront of your brain as things to avoid at FMU? Well, I think I, I, think I touched on them. I, I think that... Um a lot of stations put some type of political ideology ahead of almost anything else, and I think that's a, that's a big problem. And WFMU has uh, sort of uh, one of the one of the advantages, I suppose, we've had is that we're somewhat apolitical, um, or we can seem apolitical. I think I think once you join the station uh, and you you get to know people behind the scenes, you realize that. Just as as at most public community college stations, most people are left leaning. Um, yet there's very little political programming on the air, um, and the political ideology is not first and foremost. Whereas I think at a lot of stations, that is kind of their goal is to affect political change. So the politics, the politics uh, takes priority over the music, and even worse than taking priority over the music, it takes priority over the craft of radio. And at WFMU, we've tried to put the craft of radio and music first. There is sometimes an implicit political uh, outlook and sometimes not. Um, in fact, there are actually many conservative people on the air on WFMU um, as well. But you, you wouldn't know it to, to listen to their programming. I think the point you've just made is something that we can't emphasize enough in this conversation, the, the fact that politics when taken a certain way, taken to a certain extreme, can poison a radio station when it's prioritized above above all else. Now, I myself am not strongly political, but as you've said, there is a certain stripe that tends to be attracted to community college, freeform radio, and all of that. And I do wonder, since you mentioned that there are, there are of course, the standard left-leaning people, you would expect them at FMU, and then some conservatives as well, which some wouldn't expect, the relative apoliticality of FMU now, is that achieved more by a, a station culture where DJs are encouraged not to get super political or by a culture that simply attracts those who are, are not inclined to turn their shows into pulpits? Or is it a, a bit of a feedback loop of both? Yeah, I, I guess that's the best way to describe it, a feedback loop of both. I, I think what happens... Um, it, it, it again, it's just it's some kind of amazing self-regulatory mechanism that's developed over the decades, and I'm not quite sure how it works. But if somebody starts getting overtly political on the air, <laughs> they, they invariably get positive <laughs> feedback and negative feedback, uh, and and sometimes quite a bit of negative feedback, regardless of what their political view is. Sometimes negative feedback from people who even agree with them politically. That's just not 
It's just not what people are coming to FMU for. They're not coming to FMU for the soapbox. I want to talk about a couple other technological things that have been impressive at FMU. Number one is, of course, we've mentioned the, the, the station streams. Everyone knows that. But also, it seems to me it, it's been a, a super important plank of the strategy is that every show gets archived. Now, that's more unusual. How did that come about? Um, that was a that was just a big priority of mine um, back in about 2000 when uh, it was it was clear that it was technically possible for us to do that um, and I just very very much wanted to make our programming available on demand and uh, we started experimenting with it in 2000 did a couple of shows in 2000 got the bugs worked out and then in the beginning of 2001 began doing it 24 hours a day. Uh, and it was controversial at the station as well. I mean, that, that was another case where here was this techno technological innovation um, that I felt as general manager was very important, but it was met with uh, both enthusiasm and resistance at the staff level. And the resistance, again, was people having trouble breaking out of the radio mindset. Um, when, when you're talking about making your programming available on demand, um, of course, a lot of programmers, their first thought is, their first thought was something along the lines of, wait a minute, are you saying that our listeners don't even have to listen to me while I'm on the air? <laughs> like they can turn on another program while I'm doing my show? No, I don't want that at all. And I would have to say, well, yes, that is technically possible, but you also benefit from that because when you're off the air, uh, they can listen to your show. So it, so it goes both ways. But there was a lot of resistance to breaking down the time-space continuum um, and getting people away from this idea that... Um, our listeners have to listen to you and they have no other option unless they happen to be trading cassettes <laughs> with other listeners around the country, which actually used to happen quite a bit, too. And what we found was that uh, when we did start archiving and making our, our programming available 24 hours a day, it didn't cut down our live stream audience. It actually increased it because it just brought more people into the site. It, it was just another feature that brought more listeners overall. The complaint that archiving would would mean that a certain DJ's program was not mandatory to listen to at the time of broadcast speaks, it seems to me, to a somewhat, a somewhat disturbing mindset that, that a DJ would believe that if they were on the air, that there was some requirement that they be listened to, despite the fact that even, even in the earliest days of FMU, people could have turned to other media. I mean, did they actually believe that, that, that someone was being forced to listen to them? Yeah, kind of in a way. Um, I, I think I think that does get to a much larger problem, and and it's still a problem that we're dealing with in different ways, um, which is that uh, traditional media people, whether we're talking about radio or television, and to a lesser extent print, um, have enjoyed quasi local monopolies, and and the idea of the quasi local monopoly is blown away by the internet. Uh, but people who've been working in traditional media for many decades really have a lot of trouble with that. Uh, the fact that there's so much choice now that pretty much everything is available all the time from eight zillion different places at once. I find at WFMU that I, I keep running into this problem, uh, that that there's certain resistance to things because people are, uh, people are used to having this monopoly. Um, for, perhaps we don't have, WFMU never had a complete monopoly. It was certainly not the only radio station in the New York City, New Jersey area. But for the type of music that we were playing and the type of approach we were taking, we really were one of the only outlets out there. Uh, that's no longer the case. Now, for anything that we're doing, there's a zillion places to find it. Uh, and what we, have to, what we have to rest on is the, the overall site, the overall structure, uh, and the overall, all the different services that we're putting out there. Uh, it's, it's no longer, you can no longer count on people more or less being forced to endure what they don't like in order to be exposed to what they do like. Um, yet I still find um, some programmers, uh, both at this radio station as well as many other radio stations, still kind of clinging to that idea. Another, another example of the same thing that's manifested itself in the last couple of years is that we now have a chat board uh, that our DJs can activate if they want to. It's, it's, up to uh, it's up to each DJ. So as they're doing their show, they're typing in the name of the music and the artist uh, and the album that they're playing on the air. And then there's a chat board that listeners can uh, comment on the music or the radio program or talk to each other. And one thing that's been very interesting is that a lot of our programmers 
uh, are very uh, disturbed by the fact that the listeners start talking to one another about things unrelated to the program <laughs> because they're used to being the oracle the king or the queen at the top of the <laughs> radio empire and they want all discussion and all attention to be focused on them and their program but that is not how it works if you have if you have a group of listeners who are listening to something in a room together they are invariably going to start talking about other things even while they're listening and that's what happens in these chat board but some some listeners get a little disturbed and upset by that now, your, your job has never been regarded by uh, by listeners and observers of WFMU as a, as a particularly easy one by any means. But it sounds as if th- the management of so many of the so many of those let's call them strong and idiosyncratic personalities. It's got to be one of the most difficult components. Not not in a bad way, but that that must be a, a, a unique challenge. I'll say. Um, yeah, I guess it is. I think it's a lot easier at a station like WFMU than, than it would be at many other stations because of the the relative absence of identity politics. Ah, yes. You mentioned earlier that there are now a zillion ways for listeners who are inclined to get, I mean, bro- very broadly speaking, freeform type radio. They can go anywhere. They can go, they can listen to almost any freeform station in the country, many in, in the whole world. Because of that, do you think that this is the best time for a freeform listener, or is there some downside I'm not seeing? Because to me, it seems like this is the best era to listen freeform. I'm not sure. That's 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 a good question. Um, in 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 some ways, there's too many choices now. I think uh, that leave people a little bit confounded and um, confused <laughs> as to where to turn. Uh, and I, I think that there was a lot to be said for the. Uh, for the heyday of underground radio, nineteen sixty seven in the United States anyway, nineteen sixty seven to nineteen seventy one or seventy two, when every uh, every moderate sized city uh, in the country had several really interesting radio stations to listen to that had a that had a local flavor that had a distinct personality, and I think the fact that there were fewer choices back then um, made some of those outlets more vibrant. Uh, when I was saying when I was saying earlier that uh, everybody can choose from everything at any time from eight zillion different locations, I wasn't necessarily talking about freeform radio because uh, what we find now is that the music that we play is no longer so unique. Um, in the early days of the internet, you could do a Google search or any kind of web search for an obscure artist, and oftentimes the first thing that would pop up would be a WFMU playlist. That's not really the case anymore. Now, now if you type in some super obscure artist. Oftentimes, the first thing that will pop up is a last FM playlist um, or some other source for that same music that we previously had a quasi monopoly on. So it's not necessarily that freeform radio is so ubiquitous and, and available. I think there's still a relative lack of good, interesting freeform radio. In fact, there's less of it now than there was at many points in the past. Um, but music and musical information is much more readily available, especially for obscure music than it's ever been. And it, this is the golden age for that. This definitely is the golden age for being able to search out musical history and musical nuggets and oddities and obscure stuff. How much of a threat, and this is a subject you've talked about in many other venues, but how much of a threat is the, what I'll call the desperation of record labels, music companies, and all that? Uh, how much of a threat is, is there litigiousness to the future of freeform radio, at, at FMU or otherwise? It's hard to say. The, the royalty battles that you're alluding to um, with the Record Industry Association of America or the RIAA, uh, and their enforcement arm sound exchange. Those have been raging uh, for quite a while now, uh, and it's definitely a threat. I'm not sure how big of a threat it is. Um, those those entities, I think, are much more interested in the super large players, um, the Pandoras, the Last FMs, AOL Radio, uh, the, the really super large streaming media players, and, of course, satellite radio. They're much more interested in getting a cut of the revenue from those entities than they are from uh, public radio and non-commercial community college radio. Um, but but unfortunately, um, the way the royalty and the rules have been structured um, is is extremely restrictive um, on, on stations, and uh, 
It's also structured in such a way that it makes it very, very, it makes it cost prohibitive for stations to succeed. So uh, the, the most recent agreement that was struck between the Corporation of Public Broadcasting and Sound Exchange seems to be fairly good on the surface until you realize that the whole thing falls apart as soon as any station develops any kind of significant audience. Uh, and it seems to me to be kind of backwards to be penalizing the stations for success, especially when we're talking about the stations that have done such a great job historically breaking new acts and breaking new artists uh, that were ignored by the mainstream media. But that that does seem to be what's happening. And, and the problem, I think, is not that... Um, Stations are against paying royalties to artists and record labels. Um, but the, the problem has been that uh, these entities have not really been going for reasonable royalties. Uh, they're, going for, they're going for very, very cost-prohibitive royalties. And it would seem to me that what they're trying to do is reduce the number of people who are able to play in the new medium. Isn't there an element there, though, of not biting the hand that feeds them, but certainly biting the hand that is handing out information about the music they would theoretically sell to listeners who might be willing to buy it, no? Yeah, there's uh, there's many different ways of, of looking at it. On, on one hand, my perspective has been that college, community, public radio has done a very excellent job going back decades of breaking all sorts of new bands and artists into the mainstream, as well as entire genres into the mainstream that that never would have gotten there um, without them. On the other hand, uh, I can understand the music industry's uh, frustration with um, not being able to get a penny um, out of the capitalization that you saw, especially during the dot-com mania era, when you saw a company like AudioNet uh, turn into broadcast.com and then broadcast.com was purchased by Yahoo for $5 billion. And all it was was an aggregator of radio programming. And all those radio stations were doing was simply playing records. So here $5 billion was created and the record industries and the artists and the composers didn't get a penny of that $5 billion. If you look at that, yes, I understand why they're <laughs> frustrated with that. Um, but I think they've come down extremely hard um, to the point that they are squashing they, they are squashing um, what's in their long-term best interest. Given that some observe that the march of technology as far as ways for people to get media, ways for people to give media to others, receive media from others, just to transfer things and to acquire things via the Internet and whatever other means succeed it, uh, it, it seems to outpace the it seems to outpace the extent to which these channels are policeable. Uh, do do you do you, is that a view you share yourself that that technology goes a bit faster than these sorts of uh, than 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 co companies can s stamp down on them? Uh, do you do you do you know what I mean? That there's that the the idea maybe utopian, maybe sort of techno utopian that uh, that the channels that users can get their media from will tend to win out in the end because they'll be one step ahead of the lawsuits. Well, that's that's true to a certain extent. Um, I, there's there's no doubt that technology moves much faster than uh, the industry or than or than the legal profession can possibly keep up with. There's no question about it. And that you stamp out Napster and then immediately a dozen new Napsters, smaller ones pop up in their place, and then you stamp out those, and then there's 50 even smaller ones. Um, so it does become it does become a, a fairly impossible task to uh, to stamp out piracy. Um, and and I do think that that is. One of the one of the problems that the music industry has suffered from is that they were way too slow and they were way too behind the curve to realize what was happening um, in order in order to really become a, a more significant player in the digital age. And there is one thing I wanted to make sure to get to as we get toward the end of the show, which is the very important the very important factor of survival as regards FMU. So many stations worry about this. I think I think maybe every freeform station does just because of the nature of, of the way they get their funds Th that, you know, how do how do we survive? Do we do we put in inline uh, sp sponsorships? Do we put do we have DJs asking for money all the time? Do, do we remind people that they're freeloading if they're not giving us any money? But to FMU, they, of course, there's the donation drive. But 
primarily it's the strategy seems to be to give as much away for free as possible and and just widen the audience and then that'll also widen the potential supporters have i mischaracterized this at all no you haven't and and it's a it's a pretty important point because there's a lot of talk lately and there's a new book called free um, and in fact, this is what public radio and community radio has been doing for years, which has been basically giving away the product for free. Uh, not Obviously, anybody can turn on the radio and listen. And on a commercial free station, there's no advertising uh, to support it. And then what public radio has done is simply ask for donations, uh, being fully aware that over 90% of the people who are listening are not going to give them money. Um, so this has been the broadcast model for public radio for decades Going, going way back to the uh, to the early 60s, I guess, when uh, KRAB in Seattle kind of initiated this concept with great success. Uh, this has become the model, and it's the same model that can flourish on the Internet as well. And that's exactly what, that, that is exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to just attract as many listeners as we can, put as few hurdles in their way as possible so that we don't require registration for just about anything we do. We don't we don't insert pop up ads. Uh, we don't insert audio messages before the stream starts playing. We just want to eliminate as many hurdles as possible and make make the uh, listening experience as easy as we possibly can um, so that we get the largest audience that we possibly can, knowing that most of those people are never going to give us a penny, but the more listeners we have, uh, the more people there will be who will give us something when we ask. So it's a gift economy. Uh, or a charitable business model, depend, depending on how you want to characterize it. But it does it does work. Well, Ken Friedman, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the program. Thank you. You can find more about WFMU at WFMU.org. Of course, this has been the Marketplace of Ideas. I've been Colin Marshall. Find the website of our theme music producer, Ben Althaus, at BenAlthaus.com. And find our complete interview archive. Listen to any Marketplace of Ideas again at ColinMarshallRadio.com. If you have any kind of feedback, positive, negative, or whatever, please direct it to Colin at ColinMarshallRadio.com. Thank you for tuning in. We'll catch you next time.